Back in the last chapter when we were interested in, in surfaces and, calc and calculating tangent planes to surfaces, we looked at parameterized surfaces. But then we were looking very locally and we wanted to describe tangent planes at points. In this section, as an application of integration, we're going to look at parameterized surfaces again, but this time to calculate the area of, so the surface area of the entire surface. This is not a local question, although really it boils down to, essentially it boils down to defining an element of area, so an infinitesimal chunk of area on the surface in some nice way that we can calculate. This section will be incredibly important to us in the next chapter when we look at integrating vector fields and we have to integrate a vector field over a surface. So this is kind of crucial material. So the first, uh, we need to talk about uh, the kind of parameterization that we're going to look at. I don't want to dwell on this too long. I wrote it carefully in the book. Um, but we're going to have a basic parameterization. You can or you could just say the parameterization, just realize this is the kind we're going to use. You shouldn't get too caught up in the technicalities of the definition, but basic parameterization of a, of a surface. Because the, what the definition is going to say is, oh, we want it to be reasonable and there'll be a condition on it that we've seen before that we saw when we looked at tangent planes regularity and that'll be present now so that the infinitesimal chunk of area that we describe on the surface isn't zero so a basic parameterization of the surface you need the domain d to have an main D um, with a non-empty interior W. Ooh, this is going to be the domain of our parameterization and we want to parameterize an actual surface so we uh, need the domain to have non-empty interior so that it, it's two-dimensional in R2. Of the domain D, ah yes, I didn't say an R2. The domain, this should be, okay. You have a domain D, which is a subset of R2. With non-empty interior. which I'll call W. So you start with a fairly nice set, but we want its boundary to be nice too. We don't want its boundary to be too weird. Not into interior W and with boundary consisting of a finite number of points and curves. And when I say curve here, I mean of class C1. So continuously different images of continuously differentiable parameterizations of curves. So. As I said, you shouldn't get too caught up in the technicalities. This just means the domain of our parameterization, you know, it could be almost anything. It could be lots of different things. But, you know, we want it to have non-empty interior and the boundary should consist of some finite number of curves and maybe some points with you can have some sharp. No, but usually our domain will be something like a rectangle or a disk. So a 
closed disc. Typically, it will be compact. Okay, and then two, of course, two, we, the parameterization, you have a function, just write a function. A function, it's frequently called R, but it doesn't need to be called R. R, favorite parameter variables, U and V, but they don't have to be called U and V. Uh, C1 function, so a continuously differentiable. Differentiable function, R, from, well, from our domain into R3, so because it's, we're looking at surfaces in R3. Um, we also need the regularity condition, but before that, we'll say um, three, that R is one-to-one -one when restricted W, the interior of the domain. This is so that when we parameterize the surface, we don't mind if our parameterization overlaps on the boundary of the parameterization because the boundary is one or zero dimensional and that won't give us extra area on the surface. But we don't want the interior, which is two dimensional, the interior of D, to come back and overlap itself when you're in the parameterization because then you'd be counting area more than once. Uh, and finally, R restricted to W is regular. We looked at this earlier. So what this means is the partial derivatives of R are linearly independent. Um, but the nice way of saying that now, as we talked about in the earlier chapter, i.e., if you take the partial derivative of R with respect to U and cross it, take the cross product of that with the partial derivative of R with respect to V, you get something non-zero. As we'll see in a minute, um, this condition is present so that area well, so that your infinitesimal areas that you're calculating aren't zero, so that the parameterization is giving you something nice, a, kind of a smooth surface at places where it's regular. Although, this is restricted to, to W, so on the boundary, R doesn't need to satisfy this condition, and there'll be cases where that's Im important to us, where things are allowed to be a little bad on the, on the boundary, and still you get a reasonable calculation of the area. Um, I should say, continuously differentiable function on a domain D, well, if it's compact, so it has, you know, imagine some boundary, then, or it has some boundary, then um, you mean that R extends to an open neighborhood of D where it's C1, so that that's what you mean by a continuously differentiable function on a set that has some boundary, you mean that the function extends to a continuously differentiable function on a bigger open set. All right, those are the technicalities that really seriously shouldn't get too caught up in. Um, we'll look at some examples, but if we're given such a thing, a basic parameterization, well, how do you calculate area? Well, it's all a question of how you calculate infinitesimal pieces of area on the surface, so you've got some surface. Ah, I should have said, the image of a basic parameterization um, is a surface. That's what we mean by a parameterized surface. It's the image of one of these basic parameterizations. Or you might have a really complicated surface and need to put two or more basic parameterizations together. Parameterize part of your surface by one parameterization and part by another. So, Here's some surface. 
S, so I'm imagining some surface. And we'd like to calculate little blobs of area on the surface. So um, well, I'll explain the kind of little curvy quadra, uh, curvy parallelogram -y thing I'm drawing in a second. But you've got some surface. I can't draw the area infinitesimal, or you wouldn't be able to see it, but um, you know, here's some little blob of area on the surface, and what we'd like, imagine it's really small. And what we'd like to know is, okay, what's an expression for such a little piece of area in terms of R? Because if you find that, of course we'll define the entire surface area. We're just going to define it to be some double integral, so some continuous sum of all of the little chunks of area. But what we want to do is be able, we, you know, the whole point of parameterizing is the parameter domain is in R2, just kind of inside the, the UV plane. And we understand area there, so what we'd like to do is calculate the surface area of S by really calculating a double integral over our region in, in the UV plane. So the whole question is, you know, of course this is what we'll do, take a continuous sum of all the little pieces of area as we let our parameterization take us over the whole surface. But the question is, what's dA? This infinitesimal chunk of surface area, an element of surface area. And the answer is, well, The answer is, you, you look at, okay, here's some point, R, on our surface, which would be R at some UV coordinate. If you fix V and let U change a little bit, and I'm going to let it change an infinitesimal amount, infinitesimal amount, then what happens is you get another point. Here. So you let u change a little bit, and to indicate an infinitesimal amount, I'm going to write du, but you keep v constant. So this is where you're fixing v in the domain, and you're letting u change. So that line where v is its fixed value in the uv plane gets taken to this curve on our surface s. On the other hand, we could let u stay the same and let V change by an infinitesimal amount and get this point. So again, it means that you'd be back in the UV plane, you'd be fixing the value of U, which determines a line back in the UV plane and the image of that line by the parameterization is this curvy, this curve, this curved side of this curvy parallelogram thing. And then well, what's, what's the infinitesimal area of this? Well, we looked, at, we looked at areas of parallelograms way, way back. If you actually had a parallelogram, if this were not curving, then you hopefully remember that the area of that parallelogram, you just take two vectors that determine the sides, so two vectors determined by the sides, and you take their cross product. So the cross product of these two things is the area of, well, if it were flat, it would be the area of the corresponding parallelogram. But approximately, infinitesimally, it is. And so what you get is that, oh yeah, Infinitesimally, this dA is, is the, oh, I'm sorry, the magnitude of the cross product. The cross product, of course, is a vector. The magnitude of the cross product is the area. So um, this dA is the magnitude of the cross product of this vector and this vector. But what are those vectors? Well, the vector from RUV to R u plus an infinitesimal amount, well, if you think about it, what is that? If you take the partial derivative of r with respect to u, 
what does that mean you do? You take the limit as, maybe I'll write, delta approaches zero of r of u plus delta comma v minus r at uv all divided by delta. So thinking infinitesimally, we don't bother writing, we don't write the limit, we put a du there and a du there. The point is that this vector is very, this vector representing this side is easy. It's the partial derivative of r with respect to u times du. And the vector, for the same reason, the vector representing this side is the partial derivative of r with respect to v times dv. And so, and so dA, dA is this cross product. And if we take du and dv to be positive, which we do when we're calculating integrals, this becomes you get this. This is an element of surface area in terms of the parameterization. And so this is what you integrate to determine the area. So what we're getting is a surface area of a parameterized surface. It's the double integral over the domain of the parameterization times the magnitude of the cross product of the partial derivatives of the parameterization, where you integrate back in your parameter variable, so back in the UV plane. Okay, before I do an example, I want to see how this collapses to something, um, well, fairly manageable, if you have the graph of a surface, right? We have, we had several ways of looking at surfaces earlier. We had, uh, did I say the graph? The graph of a function. You could have the graph of a function of two variables, of a C1 function. You could have a parameterized surface, and those are the ones that we can deal with easily this way because you can always parameterize the graph of a function. Um, we also looked at level surfaces of a function of three variables, and it can be very difficult to, to take a level surface of a function of three variables and come up with a nice parameterization of it. But what is easy is to start with a graph of a C1 function, a continuously differentiable function, and parameterize it. You have basically the kind of the naive or the <laughs> tempting, to, it's tempting to say the stupid parameterization. Given z equals f of xy, so a continuously differentiable function. There's an obvious parameterization. You can parameterize by, oh, we'll let, so with domain get There's an obvious parameterization. Let R of U B be, well, you let X be U, you let Y be V, and you let Z be, well, then there's no choice, F of U V. So this would parameterize the graph of this function. You know, so we're saying x is u, y is v, and z is f of u v. Of course, since x is u and y is v, there's no reason to introduce new variables, u and v. Yes, we, we love u and v as parameter variables, but might as well just go ahead and stick with x and y. So parameterize by r of xy is x, y, f of xy. If you do this and calculate the area element that we, that we had a minute ago, what do you get? Well, you take the partial, of r with, the partial derivative of r with respect to x. What is that? It is 1, 0, and I'll write f sub x for the partial
partial derivative of f with respect to x. What's the partial derivative of r with respect to y? It is 0, 1, fy. We need to calculate the cross product and take its magnitude. So I'll just put an i, j, k up here and think, ah, the determinant of this matrix. So what you find is that I have this dream of fitting it right here, is that Rx cross Ry, Rx cross Ry, in the I component, you get this times this minus this times this, so you get minus, minus Fx times I. Um, in the j component, you, the, your sign goes to negative 1. Your sign alternates to negative 1. And then you get negative this times this minus this times this. So you get a minus f sub y j. And then for the k component, you get this times this minus this times this. So you get 1, so plus k. Or equivalently, you get minus fx minus fy 1. So, what do we get for the area element? An element of surface area, an infinitesimal chunk of surface area on a surface parameterized by the function that you're given. You get dA is the magnitude of that vector, which is the square root of f sub x squared plus f sub y squared plus 1 squared, so plus 1, times dx dy, dy dx, this. And you have to be a little careful here. I'm using dA for an element of area on the surface, so I don't want to write dA for this element of area in the xy plane. Yes, in some, when you're in the middle of a problem, you might do that and suddenly write dA here, but just keep in mind you need to know when you're talking about chunks of area on the surface versus chunks of area back in your domain space. All right, now we can do some examples. Let's start with an example where we already know the answer. Let's start with a sphere, a radius r, centered at the origin. You should know its surface area already. It's 4 pi r squared, but let's see if, how we get that from our machinery that we've just developed. So, um, example. Let S be a sphere of radius R. And obviously where we center it doesn't affect its surface area, so we'll center somewhere convenient at the origin of radius r, centered at the origin. We want to find its surface area. How do you parameterize a sphere? Well, the nicest way is in spherical coordinates. The row of spherical coordinates is fixed. It is, would be the capital R of the sphere, and then theta and phi get to vary through their whole ranges. So theta goes from 0 to 2 pi, and phi goes from 0 to pi. Um, so we'll do that. And we'll also use the graph of the square root of r squared minus x squared minus y squared and ap apply what we just derived and see how much better or worse that is. All right, let us be a sphere, sphere, uh, sphere of radius r centered at the origin. Our parameterization, we use spherical coordinates but where rho is fixed at being r. So you get rho, uh, r sine phi cosine theta. y is r sine phi sine theta. And z, which is normally just rho cosine of phi, well it's r, the cosine of phi distance from the origin is just fixed it being r because that's one sphere of radius r. All right, 
Well, that's, that gives us the parameterization. Our parameterization is, yeah, we're not going to have uh, u and v for variables. We're going to use theta and phi. We're going to have r theta. Maybe I'll write it on a different board, and let me make sure I write it in the area, in the order that I did in the book. Um, all right, let's go over here. Okay, so we're going to use R of theta and phi is R sine phi cosine theta, R sine phi sine theta, and R cosine of phi. In fact, we can go ahead and factor out the R. Right? So we're going to use just erase it, put a big R out here. And phi, uh, theta goes from 0 to 2 pi. And phi goes from 0 to pi. It may look a little ugly, but it's, it's not bad. It's, it's not so bad. The, the partial derivative of R with respect to theta you get the capital R, you get minus the sine of phi, sine of theta, um, sine of phi, cosine of theta, and zero. We're taking partial derivatives with respect to theta. Partial derivative of R with respect to phi is R, and then cosine of phi, cosine of theta, cosine of phi, sine of theta, and minus sine of phi. And then we need to take the cross product of these two vectors. So I'm just going to put an i, j, and a k up here, and take the determinant of this matrix. So what we're getting or what we get is r theta cross r phi is, all right, what's in the i position? We get this times this minus this times this. So you get, actually I won't write the i's, j's, and k's, I'll just write minus sine squared phi cosine of theta. Now my sine alternates to a negative, and then I take so I take negative, this times this, and then minus and negative. You know, need to negate subtracting this, this times this. So we get um, negative, negative, negative. So we get negative sine squared phi sine of theta. And then finally, the k component, we get this times this minus this times up. Ah, Idiot. I've left out all of the r squareds. Right? I was taking the cross product of these, but of course we can pull out the r times the r. All right. So in front of this, there should be an r squared, r theta cross r phi. I should have an r squared sitting out in front of this. All right. Meanwhile, back at our calculation, the k component. You get this times this minus this times this. All right, so you get minus um, sine of phi, cosine of phi, sine squared. So minus sine of phi, cosine of phi, times sine squared theta, minus this times this. So that is a minus sine of phi, cosine of phi, cosine squared theta. This looks bad in between, but you know, none of these calculations have been terrible. And then, of course, you look at this and you go, oh, minus sine of phi cosine of theta times sine squared, minus sine of phi cosine of phi times cosine squared. You factor out the minus sine of phi cosine of phi. It's times sine squared plus cosine squared. That's one. 
So all you really end up with in this component is minus sine of phi cosine of phi. This. So you get this. Um, we can factor a sine of phi out everywhere if we want. So this is, just to make things look nicer, this is r squared times, I'm pulling out one sine of phi, r squared sine of phi times minus sine of phi cosine of theta minus sine of phi sine theta minus cosine of phi. So that's what I'm getting for the cross product. Um, phi is between 0 and pi, so sine of phi is greater than or equal to 0. So I'm about to take the magnitude, and this will be a, a non-negative quantity out in front. So the magnitude is just this times the magnitude of that. So what we get for dA, dA, which is the magnitude of r theta cross r phi, times d theta d phi is we're getting r squared sine phi and then times what? We get the square root of of um, minus sine of phi cosine of theta squared so we get sine squared phi cosine squared theta plus the next quantity squared, sine squared phi sine squared theta, and then lastly plus cosine squared phi, and then we have d theta d phi. All right, <laughs> what is all this? Well again, you have nice, the fundamental trig identity comes in, you've got sine squared phi cosine squared plus sine squared phi sine squared, you factor out the sine squared phi, it's sine squared phi times cosine squared plus sine squared. So all of this is just sine squared phi. But then you have sine squared phi plus cosine squared phi. Again, fundamental trading, that's one, the square root of one is one. All of this collapses, and dA just becomes r squared sine phi d theta d phi. Oh, well that was nice. <laughs> So, you know, all that work leads us to a very simple expression for area up on the, on the sphere in terms of theta and phi. What we get what we get is the surface area of the sphere. is we're going to let theta go from 0 to 2 pi, phi goes from 0 to pi. We need to add up all those little blobs of area we just found, but that's r squared sine phi, r squared sine phi, d theta d phi. You can just pull this out, it's a constant, you get this is 2 pi, this is 2 pi times, so times, I pulled this out, this integral is 2 pi, now I pulled out that constant. The integral from 0 to pi, uh, I'll pull out the r squared too, it's 2 pi r squared times, we're left with the integral from 0 to pi of just sine of phi d phi. That integrates to minus the cosine of phi, so you get minus the cosine of phi, evaluated from 0 to pi, and so you get 2 pi r squared, then you get minus the cosine of pi, that's minus minus 1, so 1 minus what you get at 0, which is minus cosine of 0, 1. So that's a 2, you pick up another 2, yippee, <laughs> we get 4 pi r squared, which is what we knew we were supposed to get for the surface area of a sphere of radius r.
But this is an example of how you use parameterizations, and particularly the, the parameterization spherical coordinates. All right. Well, what if we didn't use that parameterization for the sphere? What if we use the parameterization just, well, we'd have to parameterize just the top half, and then, and then double the answer. But we can do that. So let's calculate the same thing, except this time we're just going to parameterize the top half of the sphere and then double our answer. So again, centered at the origin, sphere of radius r. The reason we just want to deal with the top half is because the top half of the sphere of radius r centered at the origin is the graph of the square root of r squared minus x squared minus y squared. So we could use this as a parameterization. Um, the domain then, the domain over which you'd be integrating all the x's and y's that you have, well it's this projected region, it's the disk of radius r centered at the origin in the xy plane. So this is what we'd like to do. Now we're going to have a mild, uh, it's really not a mild problem. So write this is to the one half. So this will be the function that we're taking the graph of. What's the problem that I'm talking about? Well, this function is not differentiable. It is not C1 on the boundary of this disk. And on the boundary of this disk, x squared plus y squared, equals r squared. And as you, as you can see fairly easily, the partial derivative of f with respect to x is 1 half r squared minus x squared minus y squared to the minus 1 half times a minus 2x. The 2's cancel and you end up with minus x over the square root of r squared minus x squared minus y squared. The problem is that when x squared plus y squared equals r squared, this doesn't exist. This function is not differentiable there. And f sub y has the same problem. So should we abandon this parameterization? Well, you could. So, do we have to abandon this as a parameterization? Well, not really. We can, we can take the limit as the radius of our disk approaches r. So the radius of the disk in the xy plane approaches r and use the limit of the surface areas. So what this means is, what we could do is go ahead and use our parameterization of the top half of the sphere by this, but you can't go out, you can't go out all the way to the radius of the disk r because then this isn't differentiable there. So instead you just let take integrals over disk of radius a, or some other letter, but I'll use a, and you let a approach r, which means you're really finding kind of a limit of surface areas of small of smaller surface areas, <laughs> well, it would help if I drew it more symmetric, but you're finding the surface area of pieces of the hemisphere and you're taking the limit as that boundary piece comes down to this one. This will work. Um, so what I'm saying is let dA be the disk of radius A centered at the origin. In the xy plane. And then what you calculate, if you want to calculate the surface area of the entire sphere, first you have to take the limit as a approaches r, and then you have to double it because we only have the top half of the sphere. The surface area should be two times 
the limit as A approaches R of the double integral over dA of our expression for surface area in for the graph of a function, which was fx squared plus fy squared plus 1. This. I'm going to work through part of this just to see if the integral is, you know, if the partial derivatives in the integral are nicer than what we got with the theta and phi's with spherical coordinates. But as you can see, the spherical coordinates at least let us avoid this problem of non-differentiability and, strictly speaking, needing to take a limit here. Um, of course, <laughs> if you didn't notice this differentiability problem and that you need to take a limit, it would work out right. And so you wouldn't ever really see the problem. So, so again, we're using f equals r squared minus x squared minus y squared to the one half f sub x, as we calculated a minute ago, is minus x over the square root of r squared minus x squared minus y squared. f sub y is minus y over the square root of r squared minus x squared minus y squared. So fx squared plus fy squared plus 1, well, you get this squared plus this squared plus 1. So you get x squared over r squared minus x squared minus y squared plus y squared over r squared minus x squared minus y squared plus, and then I'll write 1 as r squared minus x squared mi minus y squared over r squared minus x squared minus y squared. And in the numerators, you just get r squared. So we get this, and then we need to integrate that over this disk of radius a and take the limit as a approaches r, and then double the answer. So um, we get 2 times the limit as a approaches r of, all right, the double integral over this disk of radius a centered at the origin of, of uh, I don't know why I wrote the square root over there. Let me fix. <laughs> I just mix two things. So in the numerator, we get r squared. In the denominator, we get r squared minus x squared minus y squared. And then, yes, in the, in the area element, we need to take the square root of that, but that would give you the square roots of both pieces. So you take the square root and you get r in the numerator and the square root of r squared minus x squared minus y squared dx dy. But of course you're going to switch into polar coordinates in the xy plane. So you get 2 times the limit as a approaches r of in polar coordinates. This is x squared plus y squared is little r squared, so it's minus r squared. dx dy becomes r dr d theta. And you integrate, as theta goes from 0 to 2 pi, we need to integrate over the disk of radius a centered at the origin, from 0 to a. And this integral isn't bad, um, because if you let u be capital R squared minus little r squared, make the substitution, u is capital R squared minus little r squared, du is minus 2 r dr. And you've got an r dr, so this substitution will enable you to do the integral, and it won't be too bad, and you'll end up with, of course, what we got before, 4 pi r. Yes, I just skipped 4 pi r squared. Um, yes, I just skipped a bunch of steps. Um, but the point of doing this by two different parameterizations is you might, you might hate 
parameterizing by spherical coordinates. It had all those sines of thetas and sines of phi's, cosine of thetas, cosine of phi's. The intermediate calculations were ugly, and yet the answer collapsed to something easy. So yeah, the intermediate calculations were, were ugly, but the integral you ended up having to do was easy, and there was none of this problem with lack of differentiability. If you parameterize the top half in this easier way, you run into different problems. You, it's not ugly in the middle, but you really, strictly speaking, have to take the limit. Of course, you could ignore it and just write an R there, and you'd get the right thing. Um, but you still have to make a substitution. And even this integral isn't trivial. You have to switch into polar coordinates and make a substitution. My point here is kind of that regardless of which way you do it, there's some difficulties. And you probably shouldn't avoid using spherical coordinates to parameterize spheres. All right, let's do another example. Um, I want to do another example where we know the answer. Um, surface, the lateral surface area of a cylinder. And part of the reason I want to do this is because we're going to need a calculation like this later, when, or parts of this calculation later when we're looking at flux integrals through surfaces. So um, let's look at a right circular cylinder of radius r and height h. So I'm going to, we could put this most any place, but I'm going to draw it vertically. Here's radius r, here's height h. And what I'm after is the surface area of just the lateral side, so the, the curved side, not the top and bottom. That would just add a, a pi r squared and a pi r squared. So if you want the total surface area, kind of. But the surface area of the lateral side well we have to parameterize it now there's a very easy parameterization you give the z coordinate right what is a parameterization it's you specify points on the surface in terms of two real numbers. And so what two real numbers would you give somebody to specify a point on this cylinder? Well, you give them the height, the z coordinate, and I'd give them how far around the circle you've gone. So a theta, I would parameterize by a theta and a z, where theta goes from zero to two pi, and z goes from zero to h. And then, so what's the parameterization? Well, your, your x and y coordinates are given by r cosine of theta, r sine of theta, and your z coordinate is just z. So this is our parameterization. Um, how difficult will it be to calculate the surface area this way? Should be easy. And of course, we're supposed to get 2 pi r h. But let's check. Let's check. We get r theta is minus r sine theta, r cosine of theta, 0. We get r z is 0, 0, 1. And we need the cross product of those two vectors. So you need the determinant of this matrix. So what do you get for r theta cross rz? You get in the x component, so in the i component, you get this times this. So you get r cosine of theta. In the y component, in the j component, you get negative, And then it's delete this column. You get this times this minus this times this, but negative that, so you get negative, negative, positive, r sine theta. And then in the z coordinate, you get this times this minus this times this. That's 0. So here's this cross product. Now, 
we looked at cross products and tangent planes before. You, what, what you're seeing, not that this is very relevant for the area calculation, but r theta cross rz should be normal to the surface. We talked about that a long time ago. And we're getting that it has the z coordinate should be zero, and this is just r times cosine of theta sine of theta, which is kind of your position on the circle. Well, of course. Right? What we're getting is that is that at a point on the cylinder, the we're getting a normal that has no z component. Well, of course it shouldn't. And it should be a scalar multiple of the position vector just looking at the x and y coordinates so that, oh, yeah, what's this vector? Well, that would be r cosine of theta, r sine of theta, I mean, just in the xy plane. Um, and though, so yeah, it's, it's got to be some scalar multiple of that, but in fact, it's exactly that. All right, so that's r theta cross rz. For the area calculation, we don't really need to picture that vector and know that it's orthogonal to the surface. That'll be important to us again later, but we do need its magnitude, which is the square root of this squared plus this squared plus this squared. Of course, we get the square root of this squared plus this squared, which this is r cosine, so r squared cosine squared plus r squared sine squared. That's just r squared, square root of r squared. We just get r. And so our calculation for the surface area is just, we get r, d theta, dz, as theta goes from 0 to 2 pi, and z goes from 0 to h. So you just pull out the r, you get a 2 pi, you get an h, so you get 2 pi r h, which is what we knew we should get for the surface, the lateral surface area of a cylinder of radius r and height h. I want to set up one last example, one where you almost certainly don't know, well, you probably don't know the answer. Um, it's a nice example to have, to have done for later. So, let's take a right circular cone of radius r and height h, um, and to set up a nice parameterization, it's easiest to turn it have it sitting on its vertex, we want, we want this to be r and this to be h. And we want, again, this lateral surface area. Well, you can add a pi r squared if you want the surface area at the top, but we want the lateral surface area. We have to come up with a parameterization for that side of the cone. And it's not completely trivial to come up with a nice one, one that's continuously differentiable. Um, but if you had to tell someone two coordinates that specify where you are on the cone, maybe it wouldn't take too long to decide, oh, I'd like to tell them my z coordinate, the height again, and then I'd like to tell them how, how far around I've gone on the circle, the corresponding cross-sectional circle. The problem is that this time, the radii of those circles varies as z varies, unlike when we did the cylinder a minute ago, a few minutes ago. It's the radius changes as the z coordinate changes. So how do you figure out what this radius is in terms of the z coordinate? Oh, you use similar triangles. So here's, here's a, a z coordinate. Here's little r, by the way, I'm writing little r for radius there, so I'm going to use a different letter for my parameterization because r, little r will already be taken. You know, you should get used to the fact that sometimes you'll just need to call your parameterizations different things. Um, similar triangles would give us r over z equals capital R over h, so that r as a function of z is just this constant r over h times z. So now, how would I parameterize, or what is a parameterization of this cone? You give someone a theta, and you give them a z. And theta tells, you, tells them where they are on the circle, 
r cosine of theta, r sine theta, and their z coordinate is just z. But r is given by this. You don't want, right now, this looks like it has three parameters in it, little r, theta, and z. You're supposed to be parameterizing a surface. We're only supposed to have two parameters. And the point of this calculation was that, oh, yeah, we know what r is in terms of z. So you get r over h times z times cosine of theta, r over h times z times sine of theta, and then z. And you can pull a z all the way out of here. Right? So what we're getting for our parameterization is z times r over h times cosine of theta, r over h times sine of theta, and 1. And this is what we use for our parameterization. So this is p of theta z. And, and z, of course, oh, I didn't write it. z goes between 0 and h. And theta goes between 0 and 2 pi. So we need to calculate p theta. P theta, the z just sits out in front, and you get minus r over h sine of theta, r over h cosine of theta, zero, p sub z, partial derivative with respect to z, just removes that, that z from in front of it. You get cosine up, you get r over h cosine of theta r over h sine of theta, 1. And we want to take the cross product of p sub theta and p sub z. So I'll put an i, j, and a k up here. I'll try not to forget the z that's out in front. So what do you get for p theta cross p z? First, let's grab this z. And then in the i component, you get this times this minus this times this. So you get r over h cosine of theta. In the j component, uh, you get negative this times this minus this times this. So you get positive r over h sine theta. In the z component, you get this times this minus this times this. So we get r squared, r squared over h squared, and then we get, a, we get minus sine squared, and then r squared over h squared minus cosine squared. That's a minus 1. So we just get minus r squared over h squared. All right. So what's the, the magnitude of p theta cross pz? It's the, mag the absolute value of z, but z is greater than or equal to 0 the way we've got it set up. So that's just that. And then you get the square root of this square plus this square plus this squared. Well, we can factor out an r over h, so let's pull that out first. So how about an rz over h? So what I'm saying is I pulled out an r over h. This, then you get the square root of this squared plus this squared plus that squared. So we get times the square root of 1 plus r squared over h squared. Oh, well that's just a constant. And so I guess I'm going to finish this because I thought I'd just set it up, but you know, it's so, we're almost there, so let's just go ahead and finish. So what do you get for this lateral surface area? We need for theta to go from 0 to 2 pi z to go from 0 to h. So surface area we get z goes from 0 to h, theta goes from 0 to 2 pi. We just get r over h times the square root of 1 plus r squared over h squared, but then we have a z, dz, d theta. 
This is all a constant. So you just pull all of that out, r over h times the square root of, I'm going to get a common denominator, common denominator of h squared here. So I get square root of h squared plus r squared divided by h squared. Square root of h squared is h. So I pick up another h here. So I get an h squared times an h squared plus r squared. I was just rewriting this constant in what looks like a nicer form to me. Times what? We pulled all of that out. You get a z squared over 2 from 0 to h. So that gives you an h squared over 2. And then times 2 pi. So, what do you get? Well, the 8 squareds cancel, the 2's cancel, and you're just left with pi times r times the square root of 8 squared plus r squared. This is what we get for the surface area. Um, the way this is normally stated, the square root of 8 squared plus r squared is, oh, well, here's r, here's h, so by the Pythagorean theorem, this is the square root of r squared plus h squared. If we call that L, some people would call this the slant length. And exactly what we're getting is the surface area of this cone is pi times r times the slant length, which is pretty cool, and most people don't know that one. Anyway, these are just some examples of, of how you parameterize surfaces and how, once you have the parameterization, you calculate area using the magnitude of the cross product times du dv as your element of area. This is going to be extremely important to us later when we need to integrate vector fields over surfaces.